welcome to Fairhaven Christian Church. How's everybody doing today? Good, it's good. It's good to see you guys. I uh, said first service, you know, um, the sun is starting to slow down a little bit, isn't it, in the morning? It's getting a little bit harder to wake up each and every day, but so glad that you're here this morning, glad that you're tuning in online. Hey, one of the things that we love to do is connect with one another, and if you uh, picked up a bulletin or if you're online, you can use our digital check-in, uh, but what we love to do is to know that you're here. And primarily, we love to know that you're that you're here, so that there's something that we could be praying about. So, if there's something that you'd like to write down as far as a prayer request, that we can connect with you Monday mornings as a staff, we pray over you guys as a church family. We pray that God's working and moving in your lives, and uh, that's one way that we stay connected through the week. And so, glad that you're here. Uh, we're going to continue in our worship this morning. Uh, we've been looking at the minor prophets, and today we're going to be looking at Amos, who's a minor prophet who spoke to the people, and he spoke a very, very bold message to the folks. And uh, I want to share a quote with you from an author, and this guy's name is A.W. Tozer. Maybe you've heard of that guy's name, and some of the things that he says uh, will, will kind of ring true to our hearts here today. But he asks us, A.W. Tozer says, that we should have an inward habit of beholding God. When you think about that, an inward habit of beholding God, of like a desire to, to put him above all things and yearn and want him. A.W. Tozer also says that the complacency is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. You know, we can come into worship, we can sing the battle belongs to the Lord, we can sing crown him with many crowns, but what does that mean if we're not beholding a holy God? We're going to sing the song, Only a Holy God. I want you to think about beholding God who desires our worship here today and what kind of worship that we lay at the feet of a holy, awesome God.
Father, as we enter into your presence, Lord, I pray that you would open up our eyes and our, and our heart, Lord, and Lord, to see you and to come and to worship you, a holy and mighty God. Lord, we thank you and we love you. We thank you for these moments together in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, good morning. Good to see you today. Hope you're doing well. My name is Brian Clark. I'm the lead pastor here at the church. Glad to be in, spending part of your weekend with us. Have you ever had one of those days where it's like just things didn't work out the way you thought they were going to work out? You ever had one of those days? Just seems like it just didn't come together the way you'd hoped. I had one of those days. Um, I was trying to think back, probably 17 16 years old, probably somewhere around there. And which some of you might be like, that means you're like, what, like five years ago? No, I'm a little older than that. Um, but I was driving. You'll see here in a moment. I was driving. So it's like, here, here, was the, here was the day. So the, my best buddy and I grew up together, friends whole life, was best man at my wedding. His dad had bought a warehouse in, uh, in, like, in a downtown area, but it was infested with pigeons. And so he asked... Me and his, and his son, my best buddy, I, will you go clear out the pigeons however you want? I don't care how, just get rid of them, which is not a safe thing to tell two 17-year-olds. So we planned to go shoot these pigeons in this warehouse in this downtown. And we were going to do it with pellet guns, so we thought it was like at least a little safe. And, and so we thought, well, let's just make a whole day out of this. And we call this the day there were no pigeons. Because here's the deal. We go to, and this, this place was just infested with pigeons, and we go there, and there's not a pigeon to be found. We're like, how is this even possible? So we thought, okay, no, no matter, no matter. We, we had planned a whole day of fun things to do. So the, we were going to go from there and go golfing. And so we said, well, there's no pigeons. Let's go ahead and head to the golf course. So on the way to the golf course, I run over a nail, get a flat tire. The tire goes flat, and we can't get the tire off the hub. Like, it was seized. The wheel was seized onto the hub. We, we like, banged on it, kicked it for, like, an hour trying to get this thing off to be able to stick the donut on. We finally make it to the golf course. We get out onto the first tee, and a, a thunderstorm pops up that nobody saw coming and, and chases us off. And we thought, no matter, we, you know, we get a rain check, whatever, we'll come back some other day. We had still more plans to go. And we thought we, we had planned to go up to Cleveland, Ohio, which was about 90 minutes north of where we were, and to eat at our favorite chicken wing place, which is a place called Quaker Steak and Lube. It's like car-themed, and it's chicken wings. And so we drive 90 minutes of, you know what I'm talking about, Quaker Steak and Lube. That's right, some of you know. Go to Quaker Steak and Lube. We get there. The fryers are broken. I kid you not. The friars were, they like, they literally said, we can give you salad. And we're like, salad is what food eats. Like, no, like, yeah, this, no. And so, so it's a fine. And we go to the movie theater and the same storm, the same storm that knocked us off the golf, golf course, knocked the power out and the theater couldn't play a movie. We call it the day the pigeons didn't show up. And it's like this day that they just always have. In fact, after the sermon, I'm going to call them or text them and say, hey, I talked about the day the pigeons didn't show up in my sermon. Listen to the first two minutes of it. You'll get it. And, and we'll get a good chuckle out of it. It's like, it's just this day, you know, it's like, it seemed like nothing could go right. Well, today we're going to continue in our series and that we're calling Horizons, and we're going to look at the story of Amos. And Amos is going to tell these people that he's writing to, the Israelites, that the day that they're looking forward to, it's probably not going to end up the way they think it's going to end up. That, that this moment in time that they think is going to be wonderful, they've got these grandiose plans, is probably not going to happen the way they think it's going to happen. To bring you up to speed, if you're new with us here today, we're glad that you're here. Where we've been doing it, what we've been doing is going through some of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. And uh, we've been looking at each of their stories kind of through this lens, the lens of a horizon. A horizon is the furthest distance that you can see, which is where the land and the sky meet due to the curvature of the earth. And the thing about a horizon is it is, by definition, the furthest point that you can see. And what we said is, you know, when you first look at this, some of the minor prophets, the first glance that you get at them, you sort of see God is this angry, mean, kind of out-to-get-everybody sort of God. And if you just sort of stand at the distance and look into the horizon of the book, that's sort of what you see. But if you start walking towards the horizon, what happens is you begin to see beyond the horizon line. You get to see a little bit of what is beyond the horizon. 
And what's beyond the horizon when we've been studying these books here, the minor prophets, is a God who is desperately trying to call his people back to himself. And we saw that with Zechariah, the first prophet we looked at. He said that God was calling the people to turn back to him. And he said, listen, if you turn back to me, I'm going to be right there ready to turn back to you. We saw last week with Hosea. Hosea was writing and said, listen, God's just got this, like, this desire that he just cannot stop loving his people. And we talked about what that causes us or how that causes us to live, knowing that God loves us so dearly like that. This week, we're going to continue on with the book of Amos. So as we've been doing over the last couple weeks, uh, why don't you take and turn with me to the book of Amos. We will uh, kind of introduce Amos with the beginning of the book, kind of then set him in context and all that sort of thing with uh, some history so that we know what's going on. Amos chapter 1 is where we're going to start with verse 1. We'll read these words. It says, The words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, the vision he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, when Uzziah was king of Judah and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, was king of Israel. So we'll start with that. Amos is a shepherd in a small town of Tekoa. Tekoa is in the southern kingdom known as Judah, and it's about 10 miles south of Jerusalem. In other words, he's not super far away from Jerusalem. He's close enough that he could get back and forth to it, but he's sort of out away from the center of Jerusalem. We learn that, that, that Amos is a shepherd. Elsewhere, we'll see that he also farms figs, and we kind of get this impression as we, as we watch or we go through the sermon or through the, the, the book that Amos sort of is more like a manager, some of the words used described of him as more like a manager. And what that means, and why I think that's important, is Amos is going to sort of run the Israelites over the coals about how they treat and oppress people who are weaker than them. And as a manager of shepherds and of fig farmers, it's likely that Amos is probably kind of staunchly in the middle class, economically speaking. And that's important because it's going to keep us from getting this perspective that Amos is, is sort of like this destitute poor person who's just jealous and angry towards everybody richer. And it also keeps us from having this opinion that Amos is this wealthy guy who's just sort of prideful and doesn't like anybody who's not been as successful as him. He's really just sort of staunchly in the middle, of, middle class and kind of looking at what's happening in the country and reflecting. He also, as we'll see, his criticism will be leveled towards, again, people who are pushing against in the weak or the destitute or the poor. And as we see that develop throughout the book, what we'll see is that this sticks against God's heart to see people abusing someone weaker. To kind of put it in context of what's happening, Israel has split up. You have King Saul... King David, King Solomon. After King Solomon, the kingdom splits apart. And the northern kingdom goes and becomes known or stays known as Israel. And the southern kingdom breaks off and becomes known as Judah. Amos lives in Judah. Also in Judah is Jerusalem where the temple of God is. So a man named Jeroboam I creates two temples in the northern kingdom where people can worship God. The only problem is he creates these temples in the cities of Bethel and Dan, but instead of just creating these temples, he creates these temples and then puts idols in them for the people to worship, these calf golden calf idols. Of course, this was something that God did not want him to do. To make matters worse, Jeroboam then sets up people who were not allowed to be priests according to God's word and says, why don't you be priests? And so he creates these temples, he puts these idols in it, and then he gets these people that were not allowed to be priests to be priests. And this sets Israel, the northern kingdom, up on a destructive path. Eventually, a king named King Ahab and his wife Jezebel will come into the scene, and Jezebel will bring her influences of the worship of Baal into the Israelites' uh, ideas and philosophies, and they will add in now worship of God, worship of this golden calf, and now worship of Baals. This eventually sets up, if you're familiar with the story of Elijah, where Elijah faces off with the battle or with the, with the prophets of Baal. 
It's because of this northern kingdom breaking off and the course that Jeroboam set him on. Eventually, a king named King Jehu, or Yehu, however you want to think of it, he comes and he tries to pull Israel back and say, oh, listen, people, we can't be worshiping all these false idols. But by that point, it was so ingrained into the nation that they just sort of were like, this is who we are. We worship Baal. We worship God. We worship these golden calves. That's what we do. And God calls Amos to leave Judah, that is the southern kingdom, and go up to the northern kingdom, that is Israel, and to speak to them and call them back to repentance, saying, if you don't turn, God is going to bring, or really that God is going to bring, this nation in to destroy you. Hosea, who we looked at last week, tells us this is the nation of Assyria. And about 40 years after Amos and Hosea are writing and speaking, the nation of Assyria does in fact come in and defeat the northern kingdom of Israel. But Amos is trying to warn the people, trying to call them back. Here's the trouble. When Amos goes up to Israel, by this point, there's a man named Jeroboam II. And Jeroboam II is, for all intents and purposes, one of the greatest kings that the northern kingdom of Israel thought they ever had. They thought this because they felt great freedom from oppression. They were a prosperous nation at this point. Israel looked at her recent history and thought, who better than, than Jeroboam II? We're wealthier than we have ever been. We're freer than we've ever been. We have more abilities and rights. We have everything we could ever want. That was the scene of Jeroboam II's rule over Israel. So imagine Amos coming in and saying, hey, you're about ready to get destroyed by the Assyrians. The Assyrians at this point were a relatively disorganized group of people. And you have Israel, who is one of the strongest military mites of her day. No one could defeat them. They had no fears, certainly no fears, from this small disorganized group of Assyrians. The superiority that they felt in their heart caused them not to take Amos' words seriously at all. They couldn't see as a nation how how they could ever fall, a powerful, strong, wealthy, militarily dominant nation, how they could ever fall. Plus, don't forget at the end of the day, the Israelites knew they were God's people. They knew that God loved them more. They knew that God would never let anything bad happen to their nation. I want to pause here for just a moment as I read and as I've studied for this message, one of the things I think just kept coming up in my mind was I just couldn't help but notice the similarity of attitudes present in Israel under Jeroboam II and how they seem to align with the attitudes of Christians today living in America. We are rich, we are strong, we are powerful. Honestly, we share much of the religious convictions of Israel. That, that is the blending of religion and politics and warm fuzzies and opinions and preferences and shifting definitions of right and wrong into some sort of Frankenstein-like amalgamation that we call religion. And I, I just kind of look out over uh, the United States Christianity and I go, I'm seeing a lot of similarities between the two. And so what I want us to do, and I, I, just, I bring this up for this purpose— as we consider the book of Amos, I want us to, while we might realize that there are similarities, we have to be careful that we don't apply the words of Amos with a prophecy that we have seen be fulfilled 40 years later with the Assyrian army destroying Israel and say that this is in fact what God is saying is a prophecy over the United States. Rather, what we must do is look and say, okay, here is how God dealt with nations like Israel, with nations like the United States in the past. But there is a line between saying this is how he dealt with people and how he will deal with us. Does that make sense? There is a difference. And we want to be conscientious of that thing. All right, let's do this. Let's turn in Amos to chapter 5. That's where we're going to be today. Amos chapter 5. We'll look in verse 18. We'll begin there and we'll see what Amos has for us today as, uh, as he writes to warn the Israelites. Here we go. Verse 18, he says this, Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. 
Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. You know, at first it seems like Amos is sort of, you know, encouraging the Israelites to, to long for the day of the Lord, for, for God's coming. See, their thought was that one day God would come and vindicate, that is, make right, the nation of Israel. He would take and fix all the things that went wrong. He would destroy all of their enemies. Everything that was against them would be demolished. Everything that was for them would be lifted up. They saw this as their day of guaranteed victory. They believed that God had big plans for Israel when he established his kingdom on earth. In fact, you see this attitude even into the New Testament as the disciples were, were going around with Jesus. We see James and John tried to get themselves weaseled into a position of authority and privilege in Jesus' kingdom. We see in, in, in John chapter 6, we see the crowds of people trying to force Jesus to become king. Like, how does that even work? They're trying to make him king by force, but they're trying to get Jesus to do what they had been waiting for millennium and centuries and millennium to do. That is to establish his kingdom. This was the predominant thought, that God loves us more, he loves us more than everyone else in human history, and therefore he is about elevating us in his future kingdom. This was the Israelites' view. Here's the problem. The problem is the coming kingdom is about God, not about me getting my way. And this is something that we need to take to heart today. The people living in Israel had great expectations for what God would do for them when his kingdom was established. And we easily fall into this trap. I mean, am I the only person who has said the words, come Lord Jesus, over the past couple years Am, am I alone in this? Am I the only person that's looked and thought, seriously, Lord, what are you waiting for? Just will you come back and, and, and take us off to be with you? Like there's this, this, this very real part of me. Am I alone in this? Like there's this really real part of me that just goes, come Lord Jesus because I'm tired of dealing with all this stuff. I mean, anybody? I mean, do, do, am I crazy? Because, I, because I, I just, I look out over our world, I look out over what's happening, I look out over the turmoil that we're in, and oftentimes, I, all I can do is throw up my hands and say, Lord, just come back. And the problem is with that is that, is that, is that as Amos is trying to teach the Israelites that that day is going to be like the day there was no pigeons. Because it's not going to end up the way we think it's going to end up. Here's the problem. Every time I say, come Lord Jesus, here's what I'm really saying. I'm saying, Lord, I don't like what's happening, so will you come back so that I get what I want? I don't like how things are shaping out in our country. I don't like what's happening politically. I don't like what's happening religiously. I don't like what's happening in my community. I don't like what I'm seeing, so come Lord Jesus so I get what I want. And the fact of the matter is, is that on the day of the Lord when he returns, it'll be about his glory, not mine. On the day of the Lord, he will come back and he will right wrong for his glory, not mine. He will come back and say, this is what's truth for his glory, not mine. He will deal with sin for his glory, not mine. He will be worshiped because of his glory, not mine. That is the day of the Lord. And Amos writes to the Israelites and says, listen, folks, I know you think that God loves you more. And on that day, he will lift you up. But that day's about him, not you. So I wouldn't be so hasty in saying, come, Lord Jesus until you're ready for it. Amos chapter 18, he said, or chapter 5, verse 18, he says, I wouldn't be so sure about that because that day is going to be like darkness, not light. Look what he says, verse 19. It will be, those, it will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear. As though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark, without any ray of brightness? He says, look, you, you think you're going to flee the thing that, that, that you point to as the issue in your world right now. But you're going to find on that day you're going to run from one thing you think is bad to one thing that's even worse. You're going to go from a lion to be, be trapped by a bear. And if you escape the bear, you're going to slam the door behind you. You're going to put your hand on the wall and go, I made it. And you're going to get bit by a snake. That's what's going to happen. 
He's saying there's no escape. There's no escape on that day. I was at a conference this last week, and, and one of the things that they, they said is he said, you know, the guy speaking said, it's like if you just look out over a world, everyone's dealing with CPR. So you look out over our problems, it's CPR. Well, CPR, COVID, politics, or racial tension. I mean, look at the problems that exist in our world right now that we're struggling with, and does it trace back to either COVID, politics, or racial tension? It's, the, it, it's like it's destroying our world. We're ripping each other apart, and, and we look back, and we, and we try to say, Lord, just come. In Amos' words, before you go down that path, let's make sure we know how we are with the Lord. Because his words to the Israelites is, hey, I don't think that day is going to be as good for you as you think that day is going to be. He says it's going to be darkness, not light. Remember that idea of darkness and light. We'll come back to it in a minute. He tells the Israelites, here, let me show you what I mean when I say you're not quite in the spot you think you are. In verse 20, he says that that day is going to be terrible. It's going to be darkness. And then verse 21, look what he says. He says, I hate, this is God speaking through Amos, this is strong words here, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps. These statements each contain this this phrase of of rejection, right? He He goes, I will not accept. I have no regard for. Your worship is like noise to me. I won't listen. Over and over again, God asks his people to do these very things here. He asked them to bring burnt offerings. He asked them to bring grain offerings, to bring fellowship offerings. They were to sing to God. But God does not accept simply this mechanical giving of offerings and songs from a heart that has no desire to be bent towards him and to act in righteousness. And, and, and Amos is using this mechanical way in which the people related to God to say, what do you think? You are not ready for the day of the Lord. That day will be like darkness. Just look at how mechanical your relationship to God is. Listen, practically, here's what this means for us. If you bring your worship to God on Sunday, if you drop money in the bucket and you come and you put on a face and then the rest of your week you live as though it didn't ever happen, then stop wasting your time, your money, and your energy. That's Amos' words. Just don't waste your time. Go get groceries on Sunday morning. Go mow the grass or do something of value because, because, because if your heart's not changed by coming before God and truly worshiping Him, being in His presence, then the purely mechanical way by which we go about our faith, it's wasting everybody's time. Listen, we cannot come in here and on a Sunday morning sing, the battle belongs to you, God. Phil Wickham's great song, the battle belongs to you, God, and then walk out in fear every time we face resistance. We cannot say, crown him with many crowns and then rip the crown from his head when we don't like what he says. That sort of worship, that sort of worship is fake, it's mechanical. We drop money in the bucket so that we feel like we can keep God off our back because he's some cosmic, cosmic bully that shakes us down for money each week. That, that's mechanical. And Amos, as he reaches out to the Israelites, says, don't, don't treat God like that. You want evidence of, of, of how you're living so apart from God? Just look at your life and your relationship to him. See, at the end of the day, if our worship does not further the development of spiritual character, it's just empty emotion. That's all it is. If if our relationship to God is not furthering our character as people of God, then what is it? 
Listen, in the Old Testament, the people would come and they would gather a lamb and they'd get all together and they would, they would confess their sins over this lamb and they'd lay their hands on it and they would slaughter the lamb. And the idea was, as they confessed their sins, they said, God, this is all the stuff that we've done that's made our lives a train wreck each day and every moment and we're putting it on this lamb and this lamb, as its blood is shed, will be the sacrifice for our sins. And today, at this moment, I'm telling you, Lord, I'm gonna do a new thing. And even though the people would have to do this over and over again because their sins needed to be forgiven over and over again. The picture was that the people, through the shedding of the blood, had their sins absolved. And what happened is that the people began to think, it doesn't really matter. Just go slit the throat of the lamb and all will be good. And and Amos' words are, that mechanical relationship to God is not sufficient to cover the sins that we've brought into our lives. What's supposed to be a sign of a contrite heart seeking forgiveness became nothing more than the cold slaughtering of an animal. What's Amos's point? His point is that we only fool ourselves with false devotion. That at the end of the day, we don't even really fool the people around us for very long. That, that at the end of the day, even the people that know us best know that it's a farce. And the only person that believes the game that we play is ourselves. True and acceptable worship to God is directly related to the extent to which the worshiper's life is transformed by being in the presence of a holy God. And when we're in the presence of a holy God, that transformation is the natural result. And that transformation causes us to want to cry out and worship more. And we begin to get in this cycle where our worship transforms us by being in the presence of God. And being in the presence of God draws us to worship God. And being drawn to worship God puts us in the presence of God where we're drawn to worship God. And it goes over and over again. That is what God desires of his people. A transformation that results in the further praise of the Son, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father of his grace and his mercy and the continual recommitment to live for him each moment. See, what Amos tells the Israelites is that at the end of the day, God despises, he hates deceptive worship made to look pious but draws no connection back to how you live your life. To just come and pretend It's something God despises. Earlier we read that Amos said on that day that it would that that day of the Lord would be a day where there's no light, that it'd be like darkness. In those days, the people were expecting that God would establish his rule on earth. They, they were expecting this to happen. They would expect, they expected that he would come as an unbeatable king. This is why the disciples were so shattered when Jesus was crucified because they thought that he was the one who would never be defeated by the Romans. See, the reality is is that light did come into the world. Light came into the world. The king came, but not as invincible. He came as an infant, not as strong but as small, not as a warrior but as a weak little baby. Jesus eventually would go. He would travel around Galilee. He would teach. He'd perform miracles. He would eventually allow himself to be arrested, allow himself to be tortured, allow himself to be crucified, allow himself to be killed, and then resurrect from the dead so that he could cover the sins of the world and defeat death. But before that arrest, before that day when he was allowing himself to be arrested, he said these words in John chapter 12, verse 46. He said, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Our Father sent Jesus, fully God, fully man, into this world to be light. And Amos is saying this hundreds of years before Jesus would come in. He says, listen, all of the junk that we go through, all of the bad, all of the pain would pale in comparison to the darkness that would come on that day. But through Jesus Christ, we have a light so that no one believes who believes would need to stay in darkness. Jesus came to be that light. Listen, some of you here, let's just be frank, some of you here are in darkness. 
You're in darkness. You feel it every day. Maybe you don't call it that. Maybe you call it pain. Maybe you call it hardship. Maybe you call it adversity. Maybe you just look back over the decisions of your life and you see it and, and you feel it. And you, maybe you can't articulate it just like that, but you, you know I'm talking about it right now. It's darkness. And Amos' warning to us today is that false devotion to God that creates no change in our lives is a perilous position to be in when destruction is, in only out, is the only outcome out in front. But Jesus came to be light, the light that we desperately need. Listen, at first glance, when you first look at the horizon of Amos, what you see is a God who's bringing people, a nation of Assyria, in to destroy the Israelites. But when you look beyond the horizon, you see a God who's coming to be the light. Let me just say this, if you need the light, if you need the light, come find me after the service. I'd love to talk with you. I'll be at the story wall. I'd love to talk to you about the light. Father, today as we come, we, uh, we acknowledge that... Um, we acknowledge that, that our devotion to you is usually, it's pretty fake. And, uh, and Father, we, as we just, we just reflect on Amos' words, what we hear is that it's, it's more than just the frustration to you. You hate it. Father, how, how, how do we say we come into your presence and worship you? We, we, we bow down before you. How do, we, how do we say we serve you? How do we say we give to you and then, and then see no transformation in our lives? Father, we're, we're missing it. Clearly, we're missing it, Lord, but you have come to be the light. You have come to show us the way. You have come to take and break us free from the pain and the sorrow and the hardship that is pressing in on our lives from all directions. Father, whether it's, whether it's CPR, whether it's just sin, whether it's just pain, whether it's trauma, whether it's abuse, whether it's hardship, Father, whatever it is, it seems like it's pressing in. You are the light. And you're what we need. And we, we ask for forgiveness that we would search for so much and ignore all that you have for us. So, Father, today, right now, as we, as we begin to prepare our hearts for communion, as we, as we respond to, to the words of Amos through song, could we just for a moment, Lord, would you help us to just set aside all of the, the stuff that we think you want? And could we just dwell in your presence and allow you to transform our hearts?
light of the world, the author and perfecter of our faith. I'm glad that you're here this morning. Thank you for tuning in online here today. Again, if you have that bulletin, that connect card, you can put that, as you fill that out, you can put that in one of the baskets as you leave here. I want to invite you to stand up. We're going to sing this song, Hallelujah, Thank You, Jesus, for the cross. Let's think of the cross of Jesus Christ here today. and Let's just give our praise and our worship one more time together before we leave here today. Let's sing this song. 